Hey everyone, it is Rev Tom on a Friday night, first Friday of the month, first Friday of the month, that means first stone, first stone service. I love first stone, you know why? Think about it, he who's without sin cast the first stone, right? That's the most awesome thing in the world, he without sin cast the first stone. I, I really just like that, and so uh, we're going to do a little sermon tonight on first stone. Got my little glasses on so I can actually see the screen, my eyes are getting worse, but the VA tells me I don't need glasses yet, just these funky little readers, so put up with me if you will. Um, I had a request for a sermon, that's great, you know, sometimes I just, I, I love it when people ask me to preach about certain things, so tonight I'm going to preach on forgiveness, but I, I, I kind of changed the topic a little bit, I want to preach on forgiving the unforgivable forgiving the unforgivable see people transgress all the time and there are forgiveness issues we have to do and a lot of times um, we, we make a, a bigger deal out of those things and they really are you have to have perspective in life about you know what is really a big deal and what's not a big deal but there are things that are a big deal right there are things that are seemingly unforgivable uh, yet we are told in scripture over and over and over and over again forgive as you've been forgiving turn the other cheek we're always supposed to um, you know that that's that scene with Peter asking uh, Jesus how many times do I got to forgive somebody seven times he says no you got to forgive them 70 times seven times that's every single time uh, and sometimes forgiveness is is uh, framed in a way that you forgive and then it's over and, and you move on well, I think in our case as fallen human beings, it's a lot more complicated than that, and there's some neuropsychology involved in it, and um, and and even some neurobiology involved in it. So I'm I'm going to take a deeper dive on this tonight. I'm kind of speaking off the top of my head a little bit, so bear with me as I as I ramble like usual. But you're used to that by now. Um, so let's let's get into it. Uh, what would what would we consider unforgivable? I mean, that, that's kind of the first thing you got to think about when you're thinking about what is the unforgivable stuff. Now we know Scripture says that the unforgivable sin is is grieving the Holy Spirit, which is attributing things to the Holy Spirit that is of Satan. You know, basically saying God is evil. Uh, that that's really a tough one. Um, I kind of liken it to this. I think everything's forgivable except rejecting God. You know who God is, and you reject Him. Well, how how does God forgive that, right? Uh, so from, from the biblical perspective, we're taught everything's forgivable except that one thing. Uh, well, that, that, that's a pretty big list, isn't it? Uh, that can be something as simple as someone lying to you, to something really egregious as a, a sex abuse against you, or a, a pedophilia issue with your kid, or um, you know uh, any number of, of physical, emotional abuse kind of things. I mean, it can be pretty extreme. And, and so uh, I think you have to have perspective about what, what we look at as forgivable. Uh, there are people that look at this as a black and white issue and think that everything is the same value. And I, I want to warn you about that first off. Not everything has the same value because I used to say this when I was at the Pentagon. I found, I found that I worked with people that had this idea that if everything, not, you know, everything was a crisis. I had this one boss in particular that responded to everything at, in the same way. If she got the wrong thing on her sandwich, she would explode. If you know there was a serious intel failure, she'd explode, and it was all the same explosion. And I used to say, you know, if, if everything's a crisis, nothing's a crisis. You got to have perspective. There has to be a scale of things, right? And, and so when we're thinking about forgiveness, it is black and white. We're we're to forgive, period. But the process of forgiving looks different depending on you know this this perspective that we have about what it is that we are forgiving so i kind of want to start with that idea of perspective um first you got to determine scripturally if what's happened to you and you know you feel you've been victimized somehow if it really is a transgression right sometimes we perceive things that people did and we we think somehow or another we've been we've been victimized and but is that true is that true is that biblical right um, I know people have been victimized by me because I told them the truth and they didn't like what I said and felt that I owed them apology for telling them the truth and, uh, and you know they felt that somehow or another uh, that, that there was there was some some offense and I would say, no, you just don't like what I said. I disagree with you or whatever that case is. So, you know, you got to take some stock. Scripture says have a sober judgment of yourself. That's, that's, a, that's an important piece. But as we move through here, let's talk about perspective of, of, of uh, 
being able to determine the level of forgiveness that that happens and how the process works so if somebody betrays you you know jesus was betrayed he was lied about he was mocked he was um made fun of he he you know he was he was left he was denied i mean I, everything that we go through in life kind of happened to him he was a man that of sorrows it says he had he had a place no place to lay his head all these things and then eventually he was tortured and killed so he went through physical and emotional and and every kind of abuse there was to go through from people he had people that were close to him that he poured his whole life into that betrayed him and turned on him uh, so he knows a little bit about this forgiveness stuff and so when he says that we got to forgive as if as we've been forgiven and scripture goes a little farther so we forgive as we've been forgiven and if we, if we don't forgive people then god won't forgive us um, that's how how important things we think god sees forgiveness as and there's a reason for that which i'll get to in a minute so let's talk about things in your life what kind of things need to be forgiven i, I just want to think about that for a second what kind of things well i think that that a transgression is not just that you get your feelings hurt or that your pride gets stung i think that transgression is um, at the lower level when somebody does something you've asked them not to do that could be a transgression you know for example you've asked someone not to uh, use a certain kind of language with you or approach you a certain way or whatever it might be and they continue to do that it's disrespectful to you that that needs to be forgiven if someone lies to you that needs to be forgiven you know there there are these little things and i'll be honest with you i think that there's little things that happen every day it's like it's like the chinese water torture you say drip 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 um and and you just kind of have to go through this forgiveness process uh and those things are a little easier to forgive right it, it, you know especially if they're a one-time transgression you got a friend and they're stupid once and they do something they're not supposed to do or say something they're not supposed to say uh, in the heat of a moment and you forgive them because that's not their character it's not what they've done before and you can go yeah i forgive you that sucked um you rebuild the relationship and you move on and and that's easy the chinese water torture from somebody if they're continually doing stuff right and they don't make amends and they don't change their behavior that's a little harder to forgive and so you got to process through that that's where that's where paul was saying or peter was saying how many times do I forgive someone? They've transgressed seven times in a row, and I forgave them seven times, but they're still doing it. And Jesus says, just keep doing it, just keep doing it. And you're like, oh, man. You know, and you, and you feel you feel like you're just, like I said, victimized. You feel like you have no no power in the situation. But that doesn't mean you don't have boundaries in the situation, which is another thing where you get to. And then there's a little, a little higher level, uh, a betrayal. You know, a betrayal. And a betrayal can look like uh, you're in a relationship, a marriage, and, and the person leaves you. Um, leaves you for another person um, divorces you for you know, the reasons that are not biblical right Bible says that you 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 can only be divorced uh, you can only get out of this covenant relationship through uh, adultery basically that's what's what Jesus said and I would add in there if there is a physical emotional sexual abuse within that relationship um, that as a pastor I would tell you that that's one of those things that you if you cannot reconcile if the person's not willing to reconcile that um that you can't stay in that, that abusive relationship and that kind of betrayal um, is much more difficult to forgive you can say in your head i forgive you but it doesn't feel that way in your heart right because the person purposely did that to you they took a uh, an action it wasn't heat of the moment where somebody said something to you that was inappropriate it, it was a premeditated kind of betrayal and they knew they were going to do it and they didn't care because their selfishness was more important to them than how they were going to betray you okay think about judas betraying jesus judas was more concerned about what his agenda was um, than how what would happen to jesus and when he figured out what happened to jesus which i think went completely out of control of what he thought was going to happen uh he threw back the money that he got for for jesus right for betraying him and he and he hanged himself because he was so guilty uh, but in the moment he betrayed jesus because it was about his agenda and he didn't care about what jesus would go through well i think that happens with in human nature people will betray you in some way and not care about you uh they just care about their selfish things and i think there's the levels of betrayal we, you know we've talked about bad ones like a, like an adultery or a divorce or something like this it can happen in, in business i had a, a colleague of mine who uh, gave some confidential information to made sure that he understood it was confidential 
and he spilled the beans on it. And of course, that came back to me. And uh, um, that's a betrayal, man. That, that directs a relationship. And this is why God is, is I, I was going to say this earlier, but this is why God thinks forgiveness is so important. One of the things God says is, before you give your gift at the altar, if your brother has something against you, go be reconciled to him. Now, this reconciliation piece, God is a God of reconciliation. Jesus died on a cross so we could be reconciled to God, right? Well, God believes in our relationships. We need to be reconciled too. And so he says, don't even give me a gift if there's a problem between two people. Get, get, the, get that squared away and, and, then, and then give me your gift. Now, you can't square away every relational problem. But you've got to give it the effort, even if that means you, you can't talk to the person, but you can forgive them to reconcile so you can go be with be with God and give him your, your gift. He takes it very seriously. And the reason is when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? It was love God, love others. And that doesn't mean everyone's going to forgive you or everyone's going to be reconciled to you or even do the right thing. Because we know from First Corinthians that that there was a person in the church doing the wrong thing. And Paul said, kick him out of the church if he doesn't do the right thing. Give him to Satan. Let him, let him experience the consequences of his actions. And then if he comes back, we'll take him back. So it's not like even when you do reconciliation, it works. But what we're held accountable to in this process of reconciliation is what we do. Right? I'm not responsible for the other person. That's between them and God. I got to do what God tells me to do. And that's one of the reasons we have to do forgiveness. Because forgiveness is about trying to reconcile a relationship even if that relationship is blown up. So take a look at Judas. Uh, again, Jesus forgave him. He said, look, he, he says, whoever who betrays the Son of Man, it'd be better that he didn't be, wasn't even born. He understood that that person was going to reap what they sowed. And so, but he forgave him. Jesus is getting, getting actually, he's getting, uh, I'm going to grab a, a, a visual aid, if you will. He, 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 he's getting nails in, in his arms, you know, right, right, right through here. I got a, you can't see, I got a thing on it. Right through here, right? And he's getting, he's in his, in his heel and that, in that nerve there. And he's forgiving the people killing him. It's stunning, right? And you're thinking right now, well, I'm not Jesus. Well, I'm not either. Um, and that's why we don't forgive as completely and wholly and, and uh, um, perfectly as Jesus did. But that doesn't mean that's not what we're striving for, is that level of forgiveness. So then there's the, the betrayal thing. And I think there's another level, honestly. And this is when, um, and maybe I'm just sensitive to it because that's what I went through. There's this thing where when you're a kid and you're powerless and those people who have power over you who are supposed to take care of you, abuse you. Uh, physically, sexually, emotionally, or whatever it might be. Mentally. Uh, that is pretty egregious. Uh, and, 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 you know, Jesus talks about letting the little children come to him. And you have to have a faith like these little children. And he was very protective of kids uh, and felt very strongly about that. And when you abuse a child, that if you're the abusee, if you've been the one that's been abused, sometimes it's really difficult to forgive those people who abused you because you were so helpless to even defend yourself against it. You didn't have the adult ability to make decisions to get out of the situation. And, and so I think that if you look at life, um, there's lots of levels of, of transgression that happens against against you in life. It can be, um, it can be your boss doesn't do the right thing for you. It doesn't treat you right. I mean, there's all, there's all sorts of things. And, and and so there's a process of forgiveness. And, I, and my wife actually said this once. Uh, she said it's kind of like sanctification. You know, in the, in the theology that we have, we say that you are sanctified the minute you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. I mean, you're set apart. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're God's. Nobody can take you out of Jesus' hands. But we also know that we're being sanctified. So we're sanctified, but we're also being sanctified. This is the, the everyday thing where we are struggling with our sin and we're trying to trying to change our ways and see things through God's eyes, but it all falls short of the glory of God. And anybody says he's not a sinner, he's a liar, all that stuff. And we're we're working out our we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling, is what Scripture says. And then there's the last part where we are sanctified. We die, we get to heaven, perfected, yay, we're sanctified. So we're we're sanctified, we're being sanctified, and then we're fully sanctified. Well, forgiveness is the same. I think that when something happens to you, you forgive the person, right? You're supposed to forgive them, right? And, but then there's a process where you're forgiving them. 
you forgive them but then you're forgiving them and eventually you get to a place with time and healing and and the lord and the holy spirit where you forgive them and forgiving them means the way it's been explained explained is as if it never happened and i and that is a really hard place to get to now think about sanctification sanctification doesn't happen until after you die maybe that last piece of forgiveness as if it never happened is when you die like sanctification full full sanctification maybe in this life we live a life where we're forgiving somebody and we learn to forgive them all right and and um, we, we we make progress we strive we do good but really true fully I love that person the way God would have me love them forgiveness after they've betrayed me um, comes later I don't know I I don't know uh, I, I just know that this is a process and I know this uh, I've, I've transgressed against people in my life and uh, one of the things I had to do when I came to the faith when I came back to the faith because I was kind of eh, marginal I was I was very much a nominal for a long time um, one of the first things God called me to do, he says, you know, Tom, you screwed over a bunch of people and I want you to write letters to them asking forgiveness because you need to humble yourself. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I thought through who these people were and I wrote these letters and only one person responded. One out of the nine, out of the 10, excuse me. Uh, and then I actually wrote two more and I actually over the, so out of those 12, I think I talked to like three or four of the people. Um, but the one person who responded, so well, there's nothing to forgive. I'm like, oh, oh no, there, there's something to forgive because I knew I transgressed, I knew I trespassed, I knew I did things I should not have done. Uh, and in that person's mind, when they were saying there's nothing to forgive, it was kind of a defense mechanism to not have to deal with things. I get that. Uh, um, and. But she hadn't processed the forgiveness piece that you know there, that, that process piece wasn't there uh, it was more of a denial just just don't think about it it'll go away kind of thing uh and i get that but that's not what scripture calls us to see scripture does call us to forgive as we've been forgiven and so we have to work on it you know if you have if you have anger in your heart over over uh, something that's going on if you have pain that that uh you don't have like the what they call the spiritual fruit the love the peace the joy the patience the kindness the goodness the gentleness the faithfulness the self-control that means you're not aligned in the holy spirit so if you're feeling irritation and anger and hurt and all of these other things there's an un, you're not aligned right there's a misalignment and part of that has to do with forgiveness and so what you're trying to do in forgiveness is align that back up to the spiritual fruit and that's really the litmus test to see if you're if you're there or not and and so in a betrayal situation in a in a transgression situation and i'm going to talk about things that that, that are are much more serious at, at when the person's not repentant right there's a piece of scripture that says if a per if you go to the person and and uh, they're repentant for what they did you know you forgive them and you know you move on but what if they're not repentant right what if they've betrayed you what if they're Judas and they betrayed you and they're like eh. and then only when they were guilted only when things didn't work out their way right even in that Judas was selfish because it didn't work out his way and then he was guilty and then he felt bad same with Peter Peter denies Jesus three times because he was selfish um, and when that cock crowed on the third one and he realized what he did he was guilty but he was still selfish right and that's why Jesus said to him three times when he was resurrected Peter do you love me Peter do you love me Peter do you love me he had to re he had to reconcile that three times because he denied Jesus three times he denied the Father the Son the Holy Spirit he reconciled the Father Son Holy Spirit see how that worked um, well we have to go through this process when people are not repentant and so uh, I think about in my case foster parents maybe that were abusive I think about my dad completely because he was unrepentant about anything that he did and the consequences of his actions uh, I think about um, other situations within business or whatever happened where people kind of screwed me over premeditatedly uh, and were absolutely unrepentant about it and you think how can you do that because we tend to think people are going to be like us because I, I know the things I did and I even knew them at the time I was very repentant about it I felt very bad about some of the things I did and I knew when I was doing them 
they were bad. And you know, I talked to God about them, and and it took a long time to get to those letters. Uh, but that's part of the process, right? And one of the things I recognized when I was seeking forgiveness from people is forgiveness is between you and God and not really you and the other person. And this is one of the big first learning pieces I want to talk about when it comes to forgiveness. We are called to forgive, right? Other people are called by God to forgive and repent. We're called to repent as well. But that doesn't mean they're going to do it. So if somebody transgresses against me and I forgive them, and they're they're not repentant. That's okay. And this was a really hard one for me because there's a justice issue involved that I want to talk about. Because this is really the issue, is the justice issue. Sometimes when you forgive someone who's unrepentant, you feel that it's not fair. It, there's, there's no justice in this. And this is what I learned in, in that exercise of writing those letters. Many, many people did not even respond to me. Um, and I don't know how they feel. You know, I've not talked to them. I don't know. Maybe they want to run me over with a car. Uh, but that's not between them and me. See, when I was called to, to repent and seek forgiveness, that was because God and I have a relationship, and that's the requirement. And he showed me the error of my way and said, no, you need to do this. You need to be reconciled to your brother before you're dealing with me, or at least you need to try. Now, when those other people didn't forgive me, which I don't think they have, that's between them and God, not me and them anymore. See, I did what I was supposed to do. I repented, I humbled myself, I sought forgiveness, I admitted my errors, and crickets. And that's okay, because that's between them and God, and not them and me. Well, this is how the first step of, of processing forgiveness works. When somebody's betrayed you or done something horrible, you forgive them because God calls you to forgive them. That doesn't mean that you're not angry. That doesn't mean that you're wrong about feeling the way you feel. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that you're called to say, I forgive your transgression, even though you're wrong and all that stuff. Now, they may still be unrepentant, okay? but that's not between you and them. That's between them and God. And this is where the justice piece comes in. Don't forget what scripture says. Every single word that comes out of our mouth will be judged. Now you're like, what? Judge? We're Christians. We, we don't get judged. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Our salvation is not at risk. We're going to heaven, right? But scripture is very clear. I think it's in 1 Corinthians. It talks about our works will be judged to determine the value of what we get to give in terms of gifts to Jesus. And the, and the scene is, all the things we did on earth, our works, are put to the test. And it puts, it's put to fire. And it says, hay, stubble, and wood will burn up and you'll get nothing. And the, the good works will, will turn into jewels, which again, we get to lay at Jesus' feet, which is a great thing. And he goes, some people are going to get into heaven as if someone escaping the fire, which means they're going to have zero good works to show. They're going to have nothing to give Jesus when they see him. And there's going to be gnashing of teeth because they're going to be like, oh my gosh, can you imagine getting to heaven and then realizing that your entire life was wasted? It's like the book of Ecclesiastes by Solomon. You know, everything is vanity, vanity, vanity. He wasted his entire life. And at the end, he writes his book saying, boy, did I blow it, right? So when it comes to forgiveness, I recognize that the unrepentant person, and believe me, there are several in my life that have done it to me, and I've been kind of victimized, quote unquote, the justice piece is important to me because I know at the end of the day, they're going to meet Jesus. And I, it, see, scripture says I'm not to judge. He, he's the judge. Jesus is the judge. Leave room for vengeance, the Lord says, right? So when they get in front of Jesus and they're unrepentant for their, their transgressions they've done against people, they're going to have to defend that in front of Jesus. And they're going to lose blessings, if they're Christians, on this side because of it. Now, if they're not Christians, this will be part of what passes before their eyes uh, before they spend their eternity in hell. Either way, there's justice. And for me, that's a super, super important leg of this stool to be able to forgive people because you never want to let someone off the hook. 
I, and the, the, the hard part for us is we see someone transgressing and we see them do, doing all this stuff. And we're like, how can they get away with this? If you read Psalms, David says this over and over. My enemies are, are prospering while the, the, the good people are oppressed. Lord, what are you doing? And the answer is pretty much always the same. Justice is coming. See, Jesus coming and reconciling man to God and giving us giving us salvation through through his grace, through our faith. That means justice is coming. Right? Now, I'm not going to escape any of the dumb stuff I did. You know, I'm going to get to heaven and um, a bunch of stuff is going to burn up in that test. Matter of fact, it will probably be an inferno of stuff that burns up that I'm not, you know, because I screwed up. But there will be jewels because there's things I haven't screwed up. When, when my eyes were open and I started seeing things the way the Lord sees them, I've done a lot better. And part of this big piece for me that really got me over the hump was everyone's held to account. Everyone will pay the price of their actions. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent. Okay. Now, some of you, that may not make a difference. may not make your heart feel better. Okay. I, that's me. I'm a justice guy. I, I just feel that they're, the people that abused me when I was a kid, they need to see Jesus. And I hope I do. I pray that all those people have become Christians and they get to heaven and they're perfected. You know, I really do. But I also know that I feel better knowing that they're going to have to see Jesus and deal with this thing. So the other leg, another leg of the stool, when it comes to the forgiveness of the unrepentant, the unrepentant, is understanding who you are in Christ. Okay? When we are loved seen as children of God, all these different things. Uh, we understand that we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's that's Romans 12. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be, be a living sacrifice for the Lord. Uh, well, part of that renewing of the mind is changing our thought process from the secular world, the way the secular world looks at things, to the way God looks at things, right? And so... There, scripture is fun because it says, I love this, I love the uh, the way they word this. It says, there are seven things the Lord hates, eight he despises. And then they list eight things. It's just kind of a, a, a literary tool that they use. And, and God hates adultery. God hates sexual sin. God hates divorce. Malachi. God hates his children being harmed. He hates it. Okay? And because he hates that, He's with them in their pain. Now you look at you look at scripture and you say, um, you know, what's God, what's God's mo? What what? How does he act? What does he do? Well, he doesn't he doesn't keep you from your circumstances. He meets you in them. And and this is why you got to understand who you are in Christ. You're loved. You're cared for. You are you are special. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are all these different things. You're gifted. You're blessed. You've got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All these different things happen to you. Um, God provides for you. He, he, he does all sorts of stuff. He listens to your prayers. He answers your prayers. But he doesn't keep you from your circumstances. And here's why. Because of free will, people get to act any way they would like. Paul, uh, Paul tells us, uh, all things are permissible, but not all things are good. And he's telling people, don't act out on your impulses. Don't do just what you want to do. Follow the Lord, right? The, 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 there, are, there are, there's a way that is make that, that the Lord will make straight a path for you. Um, and Scripture says the ways of a man lead to death. So when we do it, when we think of our own way, um, like it says, don't lean on your own understanding because you're stupid. I think that's the message version. Um, don't lean on your understanding. But when we do, we do dumb stuff. And and so as we transform ourselves as as believers. And it's a constant transformation. We're always trying to become more and more Christ-like. We start to understand that we're going to suffer consequences of people's actions because they have free will and they're going to choose to do stuff instead of doing it the way the Lord says. They're going to do it the way their flesh says. And when that happens, inevitably someone's going to get hurt because that's what God says happens. So how, how do I deal with the renewing of my mind in terms of that, well, one, I forgive and I go through this process of getting to a place where uh, I understand that 
that whole responsibility of the other person is not my rock to carry, it's God's. And God will judge and God will have justice. And I will have justice because God will have justice. The second thing, though, is I look at stories like Joseph and Daniel and David living in a cave. And, uh, uh, you know, pick pick your Bible hero. Uh, think, think of um, Ruth. Think of uh, uh, Esther, all these things, Malachi, uh, all, all the prophets and what they went through. They all went through stuff. You know, there's, I mean, even all the apostles, they go to jail, they get tortured, they, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Ruth, she gets, her husband dies, and she has to, your people and my people, she has to leave her people. Um, they go through hardship, I and mean, she's gleaning because she can't eat. Uh, God didn't keep her from those circumstances. God didn't keep me from abusive foster homes and abusive home with my dad and all that. He didn't keep me from homelessness, didn't keep me from not having food. He didn't keep me from all that stuff. He met me in it. And I didn't see it at the time because I was a kid. But as an adult looking back, I could very much see God's hand on me, protecting, moving, providing, all these different things. Well, in your situation, if you're in a situation where you are in the lion's den, right? God's meeting you in it. And that's really important because a lot of folks mistake this part of scripture and think that God should keep them from the circumstance. They say, well, God is sovereign. And if God is sovereign, then he should keep he should keep that from happening. Kids shouldn't be abused. All this stuff, right? Well, he would have to take everyone's free will away. And if you take everyone's free will away, then it's not a choice to love God, but you are then a puppet and forced to love God, and that's not a relationship. So it undercuts the entire doctrine of our faith to say that. So you're in a circumstance. And the question is, where is God? Right? Where was God when? I get this a lot when I'm, I'm counseling people who've had real hardships. Where was God when? Well, I said, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look. Where was God when you went through this? How much worse could it have been? What exactly happened? Did, were there any God moments? Did, were there prayers answered? Your, you, you, what was your provision? And, and we look for God's hand. And so this is another leg of the stool. Sometimes you've got to understand that you're going through something because of somebody's free will. And you're working to forgive them, but what you got to really do is change your thinking, re be renewed thinking, right? Be transformed to think, where's God's hand? Where is he? He's meeting me in this circumstance. Where is that? Okay? So I'll give you a couple examples for me. Um, part of the circumstances, uh, which I hate, my dad used me to, uh, as a kid, to, you know, get housing and things like that. But we always had a floor to sleep on. I mean, it wasn't optimal, obviously, right? My dad would meet someone in a bar and they'd take us in for a night, whatever it was. So we weren't like sleeping in a box. Um, there was there was always, you know, every couple, three days, if we hadn't eaten, food showed up somehow, right? I mean, it seems, it seems awkward to say that now, but I look back and think, I could have died. But God was in my circumstance with me. Uh, I remember one time I was... <laughs> Not to give too much information. I was getting beat up by a foster mom. And so, I don't know, even know why, but my sister Diane showed up at that at that house right at the moment when I was getting smacked around. And it was like, why is she, how, what? How did she show up? And, and uh, kind of stopped the whole situation. It was great. And that was God's divine appointment, right? God intervened. So you can, you can, you can look in your circumstances and say, where is God? I think it's a legitimate question. And when you read the Psalms, when you read David's hardships, when you read about um, Joseph being in jail, and you read about, uh, you know, Ruth having to leave her, her whole tribe to, to follow Naomi to Israel, where was God? Well, he's a couple places. In a case like the lion's den, God is shutting the lion's mouth. He's met David in the den. In other cases, he's aligning things for your future, Right? Uh, I tell people a lot of times, especially when it comes to like jobs and different things, sometimes people get really anxious. And I say, look, look, you may be ready for your next opportunity, but the opportunity that God's got for you is not ready for you yet. And so God's aligning things. And so part of where God is in your, in your circumstances, in your hardship, he's aligning things. He's going to make it better. He's going to make it work. Um, so I would ask you, if you're having a hardship right now, where's God? Where is God? I don't know. Do you see him? Do, do, do you see his hand? Understand he's meeting you in your circumstance. He's not going to save you from it because most, if you think about it, all of our problems in life are either because we made a decision that we're paying for, we reap what we sow, 
or somebody else made a decision and we're paying for it because we're the collateral damage of their decision. I would say like 99% of our struggles in life is that. And then there's the 1% that is the tsunami that, that we have a fallen earth and you know crazy stuff happens. But most of it is people to people stuff. Um, whether we create our own problems or someone's created a problem for us. Um, and, and so I'm always looking for God's hand and stuff. You know, I, we, we all get frustrated. We all, we all get to this place where forgiveness needs to happen. And yeah, so that's another leg. Now, here's another leg, third leg. I'm going to add a lot of legs to the stool. Another leg. I believe everyone's redeemable. And the reason I came to that conclusion, because I was, I, I, you know, I knew that intellectually, you know, I've been through Catholic CCD training and all that stuff. You know, the reason I came to it intellectually, even though I knew it as a young man, where it really hit my heart was when I realized that God redeemed me. And, you know, that, that struck a chord because, um, I wasn't always, I wasn't always a great guy, you know, trust me. Um, I did some really bad, horrible, stupid stuff. And if I'm redeemable, why, why isn't the pedophile redeemable? Why isn't the rapist? Why isn't the murderer? Why isn't the adulterer? Why isn't, why isn't, you know, everyone's redeemable. And if everyone's not redeemable, then Jesus didn't do anything on a cross, did he? This really struck me one time. I was I was in my church and was I was relatively new there. I was there less than a year, and I was worship leading. I was kind of leading prayers and whatever. And I'm standing in this pulpit, and I'm thinking to myself, if they if this congregation really knew you, they'd figure out what a fraud you are. And you know, I'm hearing Satan's voice in my ear, all this stuff. And then the Lord spoke to me in that moment, and I'm I'm talking to people, and the Lord's talking to me. He's like, if David can be a man after my own heart, so can you. And I'm like. Wow, that just blew my blew me away. If David could be a man after God's own heart, so can I. And then I realized I was redeemable, right? Paul says, Paul says, uh, he's speaking. He says, of all the sinners, I'm the worst. What a wretched man I am! I don't do the things I want to do. I do the things I don't want to do. And then God returns to him, and because uh, we get into this piece where he says, I got a thorn in my side. I pleaded with the Lord three times to remove it. It's a messenger from Satan. And God said, my grace is sufficient in your weakness, I am your strength. So I take those all together and I think, hmm, then who isn't redeemable? Now, society-wise, we'll say, um, well, the pedophile. That's kind of the worst of the worst, right? Well, I've got to be honest with you. Part of my ministry is I disciple pedophiles to bring them to Christ and have a transformation of the renewing of the mind and get them to actually follow the Lord and give up all this crap of their life and become new creations in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to reap what they sowed. They're, they're not going to be able to get housing and they have problems getting jobs and all that stuff. But should they not be redeemable? I, I think everyone's redeemable, no matter how bad of what they did. And I'll be honest with you, pedophilia, that's... That's, oh man, talk about an unforgivable thing. Talk about the damage you caused somebody, right? But everyone's redeemable. And this is why, for me, I'm able to not judge and forgive and turn the other cheek and all that stuff. Because I really believe that when somebody screws you over, they're redeemable. Because I was redeemed. You know, Jesus died on the cross for me. Now, I'll be honest, most of the people I know are really nice. They didn't do things I did. They're not like me at all. Um, they don't have a, uh, a a very colorful background. But if you've transgressed against God once, James tells us, if you broke one piece of the law, you've broken the whole thing. Okay. If you told one lie in your life, if you, um, you know, anything, one little thing you judge somebody you gossip whatever whatever pick the smallest little sin you think you can pick you've broken the entire law and you are now an enemy of god see scripture says there's not one righteous not one all have fallen short of the glory of god every one of us needs a savior jesus died for the sins of the world every one of us needs a savior and the reason that some of us are going to heaven or some, are, some of us are going to hell is those people going to hell don't think they need a savior. They think that they're their own savior. 
and they don't think they've transgressed or did anything wrong against God. You, who are having a hardship, trying to forgive somebody that's done the unforgivable, you did the unforgivable against God. You rebelled against the maker of the universe. <laughs> and he doesn't take it lightly. And so, for me to be able to forgive somebody, I have to first understand my condition, my fallen condition, what a schmuck I am, and how God loved me enough to forgive me. Even though I don't deserve it whatsoever. I, I, I haven't earned anything. I, I, I don't deserve forgiveness. Yet he, he gave it to me simply through Christ. Now, what did it take for me to be forgiven? It took Jesus leaving heaven, coming to earth, and reconciling man to God because man created the problem in the garden, right? Adam and Eve. Man had to fix the problem. Jesus, God incarnate, and he was tortured and killed and rose again because of me, because, because I sinned, I, I transgressed against God. And Jesus loved me so much that he would go do that so I could be reconciled to God. He did it so I could spend eternity with him. That's how much he likes me. So when you think about that and you think, if God can forgive me, and if you don't think you'd have much to be forgiven for, you really need to re-examine your condition then you can forgive somebody else. And that's why scripture says, forgive as you've been forgiven. See, you committed horrible sins against God. You transgressed, you betrayed, you, you did all the things that someone's done to you. And that's why we forgive as we've been forgiven. See, God forgave us through Jesus, right? It's an incredible thing. God sees us as holy and righteous now. It's as if our sin never happened. Our sins will be as far from the east as from the west, it says. Yet we hold on to this pain and grudge against somebody else in our humanness, in our flesh. And that's why we got to be more spiritual. John the Baptist once said, I must become less, Jesus must become more. And that's true. Not just in our spiritual walk so that we understand scripture better and we're closer to God, etc., etc. No, it's about how we can live our life here as an ambassador of Christ and look Christ-like and shine Christ's light and be that person when you walk into Walmart, they go, ooh, there, there's one of those Christians. Just by the way you walk and carry yourself. And so this, this leg I'm talking about, about the stool, is... Once you recognize your own need of forgiveness, it becomes a lot easier to forgive others because you can recognize the mercy that God has shown to you, which is a great transition to the next one, mercy. Forgiveness is about mercy, about showing mercy, okay? And you don't want to. The person doesn't deserve mercy, but that's the point of mercy. Mercy is giving something to somebody they don't deserve. You know, grace is, um, well, actually, mercy is, is not giving to the, the person, not giving to the person the thing they do deserve. Grace is not is uh, not giving the person what they do deserve. And so in this, this mix of grace, I'm going to get something I haven't earned. And mercy, I'm not going to get what I did earn. I think that's a better explanation. The grace and mercy are the things that, it, that, that allow us to forgive. That's the definition of forgiveness. Showing grace and mercy. And so let's say you're really, really upset at somebody. They've, they've really dicked you over. Um, I'm thinking of my whole life. I've had a lot of bosses that were really bad bosses. And, and so, I mean, just toxic. Just toxic. And, and mean-spirited. Just horrible, right? Uh, I, I worked at a place where I kept a box under my desk uh, because I knew any day, I mean, any given day, he could fire me just for no cause. And, and you know, that's what I did. And he was just a toxic individual. And every day I had to pray for him, right? Every single day. And I had to show him a lot of grace. Um, I had to give him something he didn't earn. Because he certainly wasn't earning grace, believe me. 
and I had to show mercy to him because there are times my flesh would rise up and really want to give it to him and not give him what he deserved. And uh, it was a challenge. But I tell you, forgiveness is a cauldron in which we get to practice our Christian faith. It's where, a place where we get to turn the other cheek. It's a place where we don't get to judge. It's a place where we show grace and mercy and all that good stuff. Um, and it's brutal. It's brutal because it seems so unfair. Because the other person, they're just being a jerk most of the time. They don't care. This guy I'm talking about, um, he didn't. He had no zero. I mean, zero inkling or even, you know, interest in the well-being of any of his employees. And he was harsh and he was, yeah, he was just kind of a jerk. Um, and I'd pray for this guy and it was, it was a growing experience for me, let me put it that way. Uh, and, you know, he was a Christian. Didn't act like one, but he, Presbyterian. Um, really odd situation. I had a, a woman at the Pentagon I worked for who was even more toxic. I'm probably the worst person I ever worked for in my life. And just personally vindictive and mean. And I pray for her, right? And I show grace and mercy and I go above and beyond and do things for this person. I think I drove her crazy. You know, scripture, I, I was probably being a jerk, but scripture says um, when someone's being a jerk to you, 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 uh, you, you show them grace, mercy, and love and kindness and do all the stuff for them. And it's like putting burning coals on their head. Um, I didn't really mean to put the burning coals on her head, but I went above and beyond because that's, you know, what you do. And it, and I think that the more I did it, the angrier at me she got because she realized I'm a nice guy and she didn't like that. Uh, so it was a cauldron in which you had to practice this Christian faith of mercy and grace. Well, if you're going through a situation right now, I, I would tell you this. If someone is transgressing against you, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, and they're unrepentant, it means they've been blinded by Satan. Okay, I've seen many a Christian do dumb things and basically just say, I don't really care about what the faith says. I'm just going to do this because they become selfish. And selfishness is sin. Selfishness is I'm more important than God. I'm my own God. And where does that come from? Where does that lie come from? Well, it comes from Satan, obviously, right? I mean, he's the father of lies. That's where it comes from. And when you get to that place, you go, Oh, okay. Um, I am going to give you to Satan, just like just like First Corinthians says. I'm going to allow you to go out there and and just figure out what that's going to be like. But I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to give to you something you don't deserve, which is forgiveness. And I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm not going to give you what you what you really deserve, which is a piece of my mind or a kick kick in the, a swift kick in the tuchus. And why? Why again? Why? Why would we do that? Well, because we're Christians. Think about the history of Christians. Okay? There, there were Christians that were used as torches to light up the streets of Rome. And they never fought back. They sang hymns <laughs> as they were getting torched. Right? Think about the Christian martyrs and all the stories. If you don't know them, there's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read it you'll see this incredible level of grace and mercy and forgiveness as they're being being murdered. Just like Jesus. Right? So, as we're building this stool and we're having these legs of these stools, I don't think you can do one without the other. you got to have perspective of what's what level of forgiveness. You understand forgiveness is a process. You are processing forgiveness. As time goes on, you're going to find that you're your heart is able to have more healing because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to pray. You're going to understand. Another leg of the stool, God meets you in your circumstances. He doesn't take you out of them. He meets you in them. So you got to look for God's hand in that kind of stuff. And we're called as Christians to have grace and mercy with the complete understanding. And the overall is there is justice. No one gets away with anything. They get exactly what they earned. There is justice. And two... And this is going to be the last leg, I guess. I'm, I'm, unless I come up with something else while I'm talking. Um, you're going to meet Jesus. Yeah. I, I did a sermon once called The Meeting. And uh, the meeting's about every one of us is going to have a meeting with Jesus. How do you want that meeting to go? 
how do you want that meeting to go? Do you want Jesus to look at you in the eye and say, I, I told you in the book, forgive seven times 70. What was your problem? I told you in the book to show grace and mercy. Was it complicated? Did you not understand it? I, I told you the Bible, I, I would be with you. Why didn't you pray? I said I would meet you in your circumstance. Why, why didn't you look? Why were you so self-focused? Why were you so selfish? Yeah, I know you were hurt. Yeah, look what happened to me. See, I don't think I don't think when I get in front of Jesus that any excuse I have is going to be worth the spit in my mouth. <laughs> I just don't. Yeah, he's not an excuse guy. Jesus made this comment. He says, I'm, "You're either with me or against me." Yeah. He was a very black and white guy. And so when I think about my meeting I'm going to have with Jesus, we're going to run through my life, right? And the first 40 years of it, it's not going to go well. <laughs> it's just not going to go well. Um, there's going to there's a few little spots where it's going to be, yeah, I got one. But for the most part, it's going to be wasted 40 years. My 40 years in the desert is what I call it. And then we're going to look at however long I live past that first 40 years and look at that period of time, and it's going to get better. Not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There's still tons of blessings I'm going to lose and tons of things I did wrong. And But the difference of that second 40 years, let's say I lived to 80, is going to be I kept my commitments to the Lord in terms of relationship. I sought forgiveness from him and others. I humbled myself. I understood my condition. I, I tried to do everything I could to be transformed by the renewing of my mind and truly be a new creation in Christ. You know, I really strove for it. And that's where you get the well done, good and faithful servant. Not that you're perfect, but that you worked on it and you understood where you're at. So what about your meeting? What does your meeting look like? Some people are like, well, I've never done anything wrong. Hmm. I bet I could find some things you did wrong. Right? And, you know, on this earth, we tend to judge things as if, you know, sin has a priority list and stuff. Like, oh, well, this one's a little one. This one's a medium. And I said, no, sin is sin. There is no differentiation there. So what's your condition? And why are you any better than the other person that maybe transgressed against you? Now, maybe you're deeper in your faith. Maybe you're more mature in your faith. Maybe you understand um, how to treat people better because the laws of God are written on your heart. And you've not been blinded by Satan. And you've not uh, transgressed in those ways because you're trying to follow the Lord. But that other person's in the same boat as you in terms of being a sinner who needs a Savior. And this is where this agape idea comes in, this love. I'll stop, I'll stop with agape. I could go on and on and on. Um, agape is, is, is love. It's one of the Greek words. And it's an unconditional, caring love about somebody. One of the things we learn about our faith with God is it's not about our performance anymore, right? In, under the law, before Jesus, it was all about your performance. Did you take three steps on, on the Sabbath? <laughs> Whatever. It's all about your performance. Well, when Jesus came, he says, it's not about your performance. It's about faith. It's about your faith. It's not about your performance. Yet here on earth, we still judge people on their performance. Did you perform well? Did you perform poorly? And, and honestly, poor performance has a, an impact on us. I'm not saying it doesn't. But as you mature in the faith, what you have to try to work toward is agape. Unconditional love for your brother or sister in Christ unconditional forgiveness and mercy and grace un, 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 you know, unconditional because it's not about their performance because here's here's the truth we all perform badly we all fall short of the glory of God um, we are not holy and righteous and so if we got judged on our performance man you know scripture says judge judge not yet lest you be judged right well, what he's saying is, if you want to judge somebody, okay, let me judge you that way and see how you do. See, all of us are in the same boat. And so when it comes to forgiveness, especially if you've been betrayed like in a, uh, in a marriage or something like that, you have to divorce yourself a little bit from the emotional, the emotionalism of love and think more of the concept of the agape love 
because if you're in a Christian marriage, even if the, the person you know, completely screws you over, um, they're first and foremost your brother or sister in Christ. And the love you should have that is overwhelming is the agape love. It shouldn't be about their performance. So if somebody can do something stupid and you say, well, that was really stupid and you've hurt me deeply and I'm drawing the line here and that doesn't mean I don't agape you. It means I don't like you. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to like you for a while. But I can still love you unconditionally, not based on your performance, in agape. And I will pray for you because you're blinded by Satan doing dumb things. Last thought, I, told, I got another one. One thing. All of this said, it doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. Okay, a lot of people I talk to are like, well, if I do that, no, 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 no boundaries. I don't know. No. There are boundaries. Jesus had boundaries with people. Remember, there are times when he says he left the crowds and walked off by himself. Um, there are times when they were trying to grab him and he was walked through the crowds. He had boundaries what he was going to be able to do with people. Um, you, we have boundaries. When somebody transgresses against us and they are unrepentant, there are thick lines you draw because um, they no longer... They're no longer acting in a Christian way. And if they're not acting in a Christian way, Paul tells us at one point, have nothing to do with these people. Right? Draw that thick line. If they're blinded by Satan doing dumb stuff, that's it. You draw that line. And it doesn't mean I don't agape you. It doesn't mean that I don't forgive you. It doesn't mean that I, I don't have faith, uh, mercy and grace for you. It means I'm not allowing you to, to transgress against me more because you are now embracing sin. And you are not one of us. And we are told not to have anything to do with you in those circumstances. So, no, you don't get the same privileges and amenities that you had before because you have now transgressed and have become uh, an embracer of sin. And that is scriptural, too. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. And I know if you're going through something, it doesn't make you feel any better. Um, none of these things are instant fixes because, again, forgiveness is a process. You forgive, and then you're in the process of forgiving. And it's, it's incremental. It's piece by piece, right? But if you can take some of this to heart about, you know, the justice issue and the fact that you're no different than them and reconciliation is important and how God views these things and who you are in Christ uh, and who, what your identity really is instead of who you are in your flesh and the fact that you know we are called as Christians to sacrifice, you know, pick up our cross daily, uh, die to ourselves and do these mercies and these grace things and these uh, and forgiveness things that go cut against us like crazy, cuts against our flesh. Uh, you, you, you can take these lessons and kind of um, massage them in your head about how does that work to my specific situation. Uh, yeah. Because when someone transgresses against you, you don't own what they did. That's between them and God. What's between you and God is the forgiveness piece and the mercy piece and the grace piece and the fact that you're going to meet him and what you want him to say to you is, I know you suffered, but you did exactly what I wanted you to do. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're looking for. And uh, I'm praying for you. I know a couple of you, uh, particularly this, this past week, a couple of you contacted me um, with issues of betrayals. Uh, and so uh, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying that God, you will see God's hand in your circumstances. No matter how bad and ugly and muddy they get, God's there with you in your circumstances, and, and, and you know he will walk you through this. And as I like to say, this too shall pass. Maybe like a kidney stone, but it will pass. And uh, you've survived 100% of what you've been through. You're going to survive this too. And just got to trust God that he's got, he's got you. All right. My time is up for Friday night. I hope you've had a good Friday night with me. I will see you again, uh, I think, a week from Tuesday. So it'll be the uh, third Tuesday of the month. Actually, you know what? I'm back here next Friday. I got to preach on the second Friday. So I'll see you before then. I'll see you on the second Friday. Hope you're having a great weekend like we are. Take care.